This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. following conversations with filmmaker Jacqueline Goss and writer Caleb Crane took place at that time of the day. Jacqueline Goss is a filmmaker based in New York. Her films examine scientific systems as both expressions of human ingenuity and folly. Her two most recent films, Heart's Location and Failing Up, address the American political system as absurdist theater. Your interest in science, I mean, that pretty much is a subject that comes up every time. You know, I don't know if I have a good line about why that. It just seems mm -hmm. like I get really interested in these, you know... Technical things? Yeah, or, or projects or someone's research, and then, you know, I start digging in, and then it's like, oh, here we are again, <laughs> you know? There's yeah. sort of these, you know, kind of well-trodden paths. I think it's more about folly, you know? Mm -hmm. I like science when it goes a little awry. Yeah. It's a special, it's a kind of special combo. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of artists right now making art that is about failure, basically, yeah. or making fun of the system or something like that, which feels to me in some cases kind of treacherous in a moment when all of it really actually is <laughs> falling yeah. apart. But I think, though, that there's poetry in, in the subjects you find, and let's just say the, the measures, for example. Um, it's a beautiful story, and it, I think there's, there's an element in it that's, it, it's a Michan and Delamre, who are two, you explain it, two men who are working together to invent the metric system, right? Yep. Which, yep. Is, which is also all, already like Fulton's folly in terms of in terms of a universal, you know, solution to measurement because we didn't even adopt it in the U.S. Right, right. And France didn't even adopt it after oh, really? they finished it. Yeah, uh, it's sort of... It came know, later after... Uh, yeah, Napoleon, I mean, uh, Napoleon right. championed the project and then kind of didn't follow through. And mm -hmm. eventually, they, eventually they adopted it, but it wasn't this kind of, you know, miraculous moment when everyone came together. I mean, Constant. progress has never really been that... Uh, like, like a train track, you know, it's always kind of zigzagged quite a lot. It's kind of everything you could ask in a, a, in a narrative that, you know, the, the world interferes into this mission of, of these two men. There's this great transformation that happens around both these two men personally, but also politically, you know, where, and scientifically, where they're originally um, posited as, as um, savants, mm -hmm. you know, they sort of know everything. And really by the end of that whole adventure, yeah. everything's changed. It's something I think about as a historian all the time, is like how you project yourself onto history. I mean, history is a really useful tool set for understanding like how we got here and what's going on. Yes. And if you can find certain stories from the past and you know, resurrect them, or they can really inform the present. In yeah, the yeah. What stories do you think we should be paying attention to right oh, now? Oh, well, like Nazi <laughs> Germany. <you know? laughs> What's one that comes to mind? Yeah. Yeah, no, but there are other more, maybe more um, poetic, obscure, um, personal stories, mm -hmm. things that don't involve sort of conquering nations or inventing yeah. measure, you know, um, you know, the engine or something like that. I think that... Yeah. I think that there's great value in these in these more um, dare I say trivial stories. They certainly were trivial trivial to the people they yeah who live those stories yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting to think about that also in um, in the context of science, where we could probably use some really good solutions for some things right yeah. now. Yeah. And you know we're looking for them politically, you know, and hoping for them to happen scientifically, but. You know, it's, you know, what's going to, we don't really know what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. there probably are these corollaries where it's yeah. interesting, you know, my partner Michael's dad was a doctor in World War II, and at one point Michael asked him, what was, what do you think was the greatest thing that 
you know, invention that happened during your lifetime, or what was the biggest transformation? And I think he thought it would be something like, you know, polio vaccine. Or well, it was it was um, um, antibiotics. Uh, yeah. He said that just transformed everything, mm -hmm. and it seems so, you know, kind of common mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. But if you know, it seems like there may be something on looming that could. People really expired in the 19th century over stupid things. Like, we don't think of modern life as being this this rough, but we're so privileged to live in the Western world. I mean, yep. there are people all around of the course. world who, you know, know yeah. horrors that we can only imagine. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, The Observers is a more recent, more recent film, um, but seems to me it's also about science and about mm -hmm. sort of um, yeah. What are they doing on that mountaintop <laughs> in what are they doing? Mount Washington? That's actually my favorite film, mm -hmm. I think. Um, partially because it's, you know, this mountain is very familiar to me. And you grew up in New Hampshire. I did, and so it's a mountain I looked at, mm -hmm. you know, all the time when I was a kid. And so, really, I mean, what you're looking at are reenactments of the gestures of the, the real observers. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's true to it in the sense that the observers go out every hour of every day and night and measure, you know, the temperature, the visibility, the humidity, the precipitation. Mm -hmm. and The way it really works is there are three observers on shifting. They shift for two weeks on, two weeks off, and then the other team alternates with them. Right. But there's an interesting factor of, of the three two are doing the daytime shift and one's doing the nighttime shift. Mm. So that person, in fact, hardly ever sees anyone mm. while they're there. It's really intense. Mm. And the mountain is very surprising, which was a real mm. uh, kind of chale challenge and a delight to mm. film there. And when we kind of learned how to wait for the weather to give us something mm -hmm. that, you know, we we're like, just let's keep shooting because something might happen mm -hmm. and, you know, half the time something fantastic Mountain weather is, is always changing. I mean, it's, yeah. it can be very dramatic all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I think, imagine though, for you with all of these films, it's like a nice place to visit that wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Would I want to live there? Because you're obviously drawn to extreme situations or lives in extremity in yeah. certain ways. Yeah, I do. I mean, I like those portraitures of solitude and, mm -hmm. you know, these kind of naturally extreme uh, environments. Those are very captivating to me. Mm -hmm. Anyone who accomplishes anything creative, I think, spends a lot of time alone. That's you know, right. Unless you're Matthew Barney with a big studio of people <laughs> or something. But I bet he spends a lot of time alone. He, too. You have to, in a way, even just driving, you have to yeah. have ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I remember there was some quote like Mary Boone said, that's why she could never be an artist because she didn't want to be alone that much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why artists have dogs too. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so on to the pol political stuff. Um, Hearts Location, you filmed that <laughs> mm -hmm. in Manchester, yep. New Hampshire, where there yep. was a primary yes. in 2016. Mm -hmm. There was no clear answer to who the Republican candidate yeah. is actually going to be. That's right. That whole film is really so much about folly and failure. Mm -hmm. And originally I'd had an idea to make a film in Hearts Location, which is a town in New Hampshire that um, there's only eight registered voters in the whole town <laughs> and so it is it, one of these like real predictors of the outcome. yes because yeah. it, they vote at mid they come at midnight on primary day they vote within five minutes they count the ballots and then they can announce to the world mm -hmm. you know who won the first primary of the first state right, right. so there's two towns that do that and hearts location is one of them and so for a year i thought oh i'm gonna make a film about hearts location and i did go up there and you know actually in 2008 when i was eight and a half months pregnant, went and shot there. And um, it was kind of boring, mm -hmm. you know, and, and predictable. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, you know, I kind of abandoned that project. And then a week before the primary, my friend Chris, who's in the movie, right. who's from New Hampshire, said, you know, well, I don't know, I'm either gonna vote for Trump or Sanders. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're going to have to make this I can movie. see that, though, because these were the revolutionary candidates right, that's right. on both extremes. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, all the men folk that I know in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. this is kind of symptomatic of something about masculinity, you mm -hmm. know, working class masculinity in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is also kind of about my dad, who 
every winter just starts barricading himself and it's all about insulating the house. There's a lot of weather stripping going on. A lot there. of weather yeah. stripping and blocking off the windows and closing the vent over the stove to save money on mm -hmm. heat. And of course, it's like, wow, this is kind of the perfect metaphor mm -hmm. for what's happening. Yeah. You know? So, so what's a Trump rally like? <laughs> right. Like, it's actually terrifying to me the idea of even being in a situation I like know. that. Well, what was it like now? That was interesting because we went, we went to four Trump rallies. Oh, God. So the yeah. first one we went to was in Plymouth, New Hampshire, and you know, right before the New Hampshire primary. Mm -hmm. And there weren't that many people there. Mm -hmm. They kind of had it in a school, college gymnasium and they blocked off part of it so the crowd would look more compressed. Is this the one you said the people in the front row just said it's the most people who've yes. ever been here before? Yeah, totally. Yeah, of course he's reacting to this sort of right. small people. crowd. Right. Yeah. At a certain point I realized all the really interesting was, thing was happening on the floor. There's a long Where series. kids are just sitting on the floor because yeah. their parents brought them and they're like, you know, doing whatever. Honestly, I think it was a hard but really good experience for him. And he, he was proud of it. He, he felt like he said, oh, I, I see myself in this new way. Who do you vote for? He voted for Clinton. Clinton, wow. Well, yeah. I know. Did you talk him into it? No, not <laughs> at all. It's complicated and I don't even feel like it's resolved yet. I think it's a very uh, sensitive treatment to what do you do politically. Yeah. The last, the most recent film, is it your most recent film, the, uh, Failing Up? Yeah. I don't want to get into interpreting it, but there's a soundtrack that's very particular yeah. and I want to know like what that is. It's seven and a half minutes from the near the end of Home Alone 2 and actually Donald Trump appears in Home Alone 2 mm. as a cameo. Oh, wow. So I'm not sure how this came to be, but it all kind of aligned. And I really, I have a deep appreciation for the sound design in those Home Alone movies, mm -hmm. where there's, you know, in the parlance of sound design, there's a lot of Mickey Mousing, where the musical mm -hmm. score plays off the Foley sounds and the sound effects, and mm -hmm. actually, I think it's quite masterful. Mm -hmm. It was and just it's, a kind it's of it's the fun. villains, the inept villains, yes, the like inept falling villains. off things, and you know, mm -hmm. getting hurt. By and the kid, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But meanwhile, in the film, this film you're showing, um, Skyscrapers. All the buildings are his. Yeah. They're yeah. all his holdings in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. It felt really cathartic to make it. And people probably didn't think it was any big deal because they're all filming it worshipfully, too, or something. Well, that? that's interesting. Uh, maybe a little bit like the the rally people. Mm -hmm. You kind of develop this taxonomy of, you know, you understand how people act at a certain location there are mm -hmm. these gestures that are repeated yeah. over and over again and you try to fit in a little bit or you no, or you just realize you realize that they know that you're you've got some other yeah, purpose no, here yeah and yeah. no i look i mean i look kind of crazy because <laughs> i've got this camera that looks like it's from the 19th century right right and you know literally lying on the sidewalk sometimes but it was really fun it was really this kinetic way of shooting that was super fun and... I mean, failing up suggests... I mean, to me it felt a little bit like the Trump administration's, you know, daily charade, you know? It just felt to me like this kind of slapstick yeah. performance and it's all about money and real estate and, yeah. you know, and attention-getting devices and right. things like that. And, like, no matter what you do, you land on... like, you end up, you know coming up on top, which is so right. maddening. Like some reverse you know. gravity situation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. that's it. Jacqueline Goss was a 2008 Tribeca Media Artist Fellow and the 2007 recipient of the Herb Alpert Award in Film and Video. Her pastel drawings of icebergs related to an upcoming film on scurvy will appear in the winter issue of Fence Magazine. Caleb Crane is a writer whose work has appeared in magazines such as The New Yorker and The Nation. His first novel, Necessary Errors, charted the development of a group of friends in post-communist Prague. Crane's new novel, Overthrow, explores similar themes, yet toward a darker end. So Overthrow is a, is a sort of cyber-legal thriller, I would say. I mean, it's a historical novel set not very long ago. But I think it's really more about communications between people or this kind of disruption of communication that the internet has caused. Yeah. Um, so the book is about a circle of friends who meet around the time of the Occupy movement. And it starts with a pickup that an a older character, older for this group, not older compared to me, uh, <laughs> Uh, named Matthew, who's around 30, picks up a young man named Leif, who's uh, 
maybe 24, and um, Matthew gets brought into Leif's world, which is people who are involved in Occupy, and also some of them have this idea that maybe they can, it's easier than most people like to admit to know what other people are thinking. Whether that's telepathy or not, I don't quite say. There's a character named Chris who's kind of working class, there's a character named Julia who's kind of from a very wealthy family. Um, so it's meant to be the kind of spontaneous group that, that did form during the Occupy movement. Right, like Leif is the visionary though, right? He's kind of the leader, not because he's got the most machismo, but because he's, he's the one they think is the most sensitive, right? Right, he's the one they, they, they believe, uh, he, he, if anybody has this power, he does, this faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and he's sort of charming and charismatic and, mm -hmm. and enigmatic and he's one of the few characters that I, I, the consciousness of the narrative moves around and he's one of the few characters that I don't have the consciousness move close to. I just figure I think, uh, you know, writing dialogue must mm -hmm. be the hardest thing to do. You have to have an ear for it. Mm -hmm. But there felt to me like passages when there was just this kind of intentional, like vague, covered. I think I wanted it to be something that they were all reacting to and they all felt the presence of and they all felt there was something going on but different members of the group had different understandings of what it was and uh, maybe it's more effective if it's not ever settled on what exactly it is that's happening. This was 2011 Occupy, right. so it's uh -huh. a historical novel but it's uh -huh. pretty recent. My How the World Has Changed and it feels to me maybe that the things that we maybe understand a little bit better now that we're kind of facing consequences mm -hmm. with um, their, these characters, this setting is a place to actually kind of see that stuff bubbling to the surface and seeing what young people are trying to do to make sense of it. Is that mm -hmm. what you had in mind? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of playing a double game or maybe a triple game mm -hmm. in that like there's the telepathy thing that they're not entirely agreed on what it is and how they mm -hmm. understand it. There's also Occupy, which had this utopian just spirit and it made utopian gestures, but there was a lot of dissension about what that meant and what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the internet, which mm -hmm. also sort of looked promising and augured well at first, and people weren't sure what it was uh, right, at right. first either. Um, so I was kind of setting up these three undefinable between spaces uh, that were all in the air at that time. And well, I don't know if telepathy was in the air. Telepathy is maybe my science fiction type well, like I mean, there is a kind of like resurgence of interest in the occult and things like that I'm not exactly sure where I had the idea I mean I think it's something that maybe people who write novels are prey to just this idea of trying to imagine what it's like to be inside someone else's head and maybe also gay people are prey mm -hmm. to it as well or susceptible to it or in the habit of doing it because you're in a world where everyone around you often everyone around you is not like you in a, in a yeah. certain way and you have to make this imaginative leap to imagine what they're thinking of you because they're not, you're the out group and they're the in group and they're not going to be doing the work of imagining what you're thinking of them. Yeah, that's the kind of sentence I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I just spontaneously generate that's that your kind style. of sentence. This kind of language or this kind of coded language or a certain kind of language between, between people and it seems to me that there is in the group of characters this sense of self-protection through that and a kind of defensiveness against the outside world, especially once this sort of legal problem takes off. All of the characters are limited in talking to each other, talking to anyone else. It becomes almost kind of like a communist yeah. scenario where, where everyone's very guarded. Mm -hmm. But then they find a kind of, I feel like they find a kind of liberation in that suddenly you can't just communicate the old ways, you actually have to go to see someone face to face and maybe be a little more mm -hmm. explicit in what you want to say. Is that a fair? Yeah, I mean, my first novel took place 25 years ago in a world before cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so this one is definitely in the world of cell phones, but mm -hmm. I was kind of interested in like having it break down for some of them, like they're under court order, they can't use a yeah. computer of any kind. I was really interested in the way that like when you're in a legal situation suddenly you're not supposed to talk to certain people. You're not supposed to talk to the people who you were really close to because you were doing crimes together, you know. Right, right. Um, but the internet is sort of like that too and it like, offers this radical transparency. You can talk to anybody at any moment but mm -hmm. then it turns out actually there's some people you shouldn't talk to. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> right. Like, and a lot of people I think are finding that out the hard way. There's kind of the old system of information exchange, the press, mm -hmm. and then the new system was just the chatter going on online. And the press mm -hmm. is actually loving the story because it's, you know, scandalous and weird. And, mm -hmm. But the, the online um, 
contingent, though, that they're much more sympathetic. Like they see it as more of a kind of a radical thing, more closely maybe related to the Occupy uh -huh. intentions. Um, yeah, I was just trying to yeah imagine what an what an on, what the online world might uh, might think if this were to happen. How did you research this stuff? I mean, there's there's a lot of technical stuff in it that seems like it's far from you know 16th century English literature, right? Which is what one of the characters <laughs> is interested so, in. So right, so there's one yeah. character who's writing a dissertation on 16th century English literature, and so I I read a lot of. 16th century poetry and mm -hmm. a few, a, a little criticism. I mean, I'm, I'm just fascinated by the internet and technology, so I always am reading the new stuff. And but I did read uh, a little stack of books about the um, hacker collective Anonymous, mm -hmm. and actually, it was while I was writing the book that the Edward Snowden stuff came out, and mm -hmm. I, I read about him. I read the statutes, and then there are a lot of lawyers, defense lawyers, who are looking for clients, and so they they write these really great detailed descriptions of what it feels like to be indicted, what people will say and what happens. They do this, I think, because, you know, your husband's been arrested for embezzlement and you're the wife and you're home frantically Googling and you right. want to know what's going on. And probably you, the Googler, will be the one who actually chooses the lawyer. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. Um, so that was very... But also, too, it's kind of like a frontier in some ways. I mean, maybe law is always like this, but, um, but it feels to me like there's a kind of... Um, doltish legal system trying to catch mm -hmm. up with a renegade um, mm -hmm. renegade um, kind of business interest that's going on. I mean, there's kind of a lag in, in the, the, um, the monitoring of that. And even one of the characters, Joe, you know. He's just leveraging the, the lag between uh, right. the, the, the government and business. Mm -hmm. uh, and if government sufficiently outsources or catches up to business, he won't Business will, I mean, government will want in on it, right? right yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, but right now, yeah, government isn't supposed to do the things that business can do to us. So, I mean, at one point you're writing this, I'm guessing you were like already two years into it and then Trump is elected and you see then suddenly more of an avalanche. I mean, for the average voter, the average fairly well-informed citizen, there were, mm -hmm. there were a lot of revelations that happened in the fall of 2016 just in terms of misinformation campaigns and, oh gosh, Facebook is really right. a tool now right. for um, throwing elections. Um, but did this alter the course of what you're writing in some ways? I started it in in 2012 and I mapped it all out pretty early mm -hmm. what the plot would be but I'm a slow writer and one of my fears going as I was writing it was that well I had two fears one was that the issues involved would cease to be interesting <laughs> we'd solve it all we'd solve it all society would move on people wouldn't be interested in reading about privacy or internet or um, <laughs> autonomy of the self mm -hmm. in the post-literate world. Uh -huh. That didn't turn out to be the problem. But my second anxiety was that the things that I'd written in the book as fiction would, would, <laughs> would become true. Mm -hmm. uh, so like when the Cambridge Analytica story broke, I was just like, this is so unfair because I've already yeah. handed in my book. And But uh, it seems like you pretty well spell out as imagining that you were writing this in 2011 <laughs> during <laughs> the period the book is set, this would have been yeah. really visionary in fact. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that seems to develop along towards the end is this kind of loss of belief in the existing systems of friendship and communication and mm -hmm. you feel the, the characters kind of struggling to stay together in a way. It's, it's a pretty grim topic we're talking right. about here. When I was trying to figure out seven, six or seven years ago what to write next, I had this idea in my head and I thought of it as I called it the dark novel when I was trying to like uh, think of the different novels I could try to write. And one of the characters refers to the dark poem throughout. Right. Yeah. yeah so I put that in. Yeah. My first book was was much happier. It was you know about a young person among young people and kind of building up and integrating a personality and mm -hmm. you know uh, integrating through the difficulty of being homosexual and having been raised in a culture that didn't didn't value that. Mm -hmm. And then this book is kind of the opposite and it's more about disintegration mm -hmm. um, and about uh, the forces that are kind of breaking down these characters and breaking down the structure of their personalities in a little bit. I meant to leave the ending ambiguous that there's a sort of uh, it could still go either way mm -hmm. but I do feel that that's you know really the case that it's still you know, stepping out of the world of the novel in the real world, it could still go either way. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't read novels as much as I used to. I, uh -huh. I was an English lit major as an undergraduate. That's all I did. Uh -huh. 
and now it doesn't feel like the pace of life really allows it. And so actually mm -hmm. reading a novel such as this felt like a very strange but satisfying and isolating experience to me that okay, might not even be in some ways fully allowed in this uh, in this like march to progress that we're... <laughs> You're not even allowed to have the permission to read a novel. On, on to be summer a... vacation maybe or something. Okay. Right, right. To be detached from the culture from that long, for that long. Yeah. In defense yeah. of the novel, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is, this, is, uh, this is my life. You're describing the depression that uh, I'm struggling <laughs> with, which is the culture is, seems to be turning away from novels. Uh, and I, you know, grew up wanting to write them and now I'm a grown up and I get to write them and now, you know, it seems like they are trying to yank away the the plate just as I've sat down to dinner. The audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think people have forgotten that novels are something they can enjoy. Right. That they have been away from them and even people in my social circle apparently have been away from them to such an extent that when they do sit down to read one, they're, they're kind of surprised, like, uh -huh. oh, this is kind of a pleasant experience. I, I wasn't expecting that. And I'm sort of like, why weren't, okay. Yeah. But I mean, I live in the world. I know the pulls on people. So it's not that people don't have the time, but there is something about the hot medium versus the cool medium. Mm -hmm. Although I guess mm -hmm. I'm reversing Marshall McLuhan's. <laughs> Caleb Crane's first novel, Necessary Errors, was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction. Overthrow, published in August 2019, was selected as a New York Times Editor's Choice. In November 2019, Crane was named a finalist for the Simpson Joyce Carol Oates Prize for Mid-Career Authors.